Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Temple Department of Dance, Institute of Dance Scholarship, and the Dance Studies Colloquium. Thank you for tuning in as we continue the special cluster titled Indigenous Movements. I want to also welcome the visit, our visiting scholar in residence, Dr. Jane Gabriels and Trinity Norwood, Caridad de la Luz, Ed Bourgeois, and Lindsay de la Ronde for this panel titled Indigenous Artistic Residencies, a conversation with three artist curators about curatorial practices. We're going to start, I want to begin by introducing Trinity Norwood, a citizen of the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape Tribal Nation in South Jersey, who is graciously joining us to welcome our panelists to the ancestral lands of the Lenni Lenape. Trinity serves her people as the head coordinator for the Tribal Royalty Program. As an advocate for Indigenous peoples, Trinity works to promote and educate about indigenous issues through multiple mediums, including art, film, and literature. She has been featured on Com Comcast Newsmakers and interviewed by Kathy O'Connell on WXPN Kids Corner. As a writer, Trinity creates poetry and short stories that focus on her experience of being a Lenape woman. Some of her pieces have been published in the Voices Poetry Anthology Collection and used for local art projects like the Ghost Ship Exhibit at Race Street Pier. She has also appeared in local historical documentaries like the Philadelphia Experiment and the King's Highway. As a sophomore in college, Trinity got a request from her high school English teacher to speak to her classroom for American Indian History Month. The, exper the experience inspired her to found Native New Jersey, a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading awareness, dispelling stereotypes and misconceptions about Native people, and educating both students and teachers alike about Native history, culture, and current events. Native New Jersey works to assist tribal efforts to build a museum and educational center on the tribal grounds. She hopes to grow Native New Jersey and to spread awareness all throughout the tri-state area. So welcome, Trinity. Wanishi, thank you. Ita, kwango melo humo, eloensi wilatanami kekekwen. I greet you in the language of my ancestors. It is an honor to be here and to welcome you all today. Um, I am a citizen of the Nantico Glen Island Ape Nation and our tribal headquarters are in South Jersey. Um, and although we are in a virtual space right now, um, Temple University and the city of Philadelphia is built um, on Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape, the ancestral land of my people. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I am so looking forward to this panel, but I wanted to take a moment to say uh, Wanishi to all of you. Um, for a long time in our country's history, it was against the law for indigenous people to congregate, speak our languages and express our culture and traditions publicly. So to be in a space with such powerful indigenous artists who boldly honor their traditions um, and express their indigeneity um, in their work um, is so inspiring to me. So Anishi, to you. As opposed to writing a rigid and structured um, welcoming um, and going on a deep dive into the history of Lenape people and Lenape hooking, um, I thought that it would be um, wonderful if we could all participate in a grounding exercise. Um, and this is something I've started to do a little bit more often. Um, in, in virtual spaces because the world is in such a crazy place right now. Um, and we, some people might be at work right now, I am, I might be at work right now. Um, some people might be in transit and just trying to listen in. And uh, 
all of these things are going on and it can be so easy to forget that we need to stay grounded and, and recognize that our foundation and our connection to this land is the thing that balances us out. Um, it is a, 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 a Lenape tradition that when we make decisions, we think about how that decision affects all life for seven generations to come and the seven generations that came behind us. Um, and so when I participate in a grounding exercise, I think about how my actions for this day or this week or over the past few months have affected uh, Lenape Hoking, the land that I am on, have I honored that land, um, as well as have I honored my ancestors and my traditions and the people around me um, by creating a space where they can be open and creative and communicate with me in a time where a lot of people have spent so much time feeling isolated and unable to communicate. So if you will bear with me, we're going to do a grounding exercise. Um, if you would take a moment to breathe, perhaps close your eyes if that suits you. Maybe you've had a super busy day um, and you haven't taken a real breath all day. Uh, maybe you are still in the middle of your super busy day and have so much more things to do and you're feeling a little overwhelmed. Um, maybe you had a relaxing day and you've been looking forward to uh, this conversation um, and, and listening to this panel all day. I want to say Wanishi, thank you for coming. The land upon which we gather is part of the traditional territory of the Lanai Lenape called Lenape Hoki. The Lenape people lived in harmony with one another upon this territory for thousands of years. During the colonial era and early federal period, many were removed west and north, but some also remain among the continuing historical tribal communities of the region. The Nanticoke Lenai Lenape Tribal Nation, the Ramapo Lenape Nation, the Powhatan Lenape Nation, the Nanticoke of Millsboro, Delaware, and the Lenape of Cheswell, Delaware. We acknowledge the Lenai Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. In our acknowledgement of the continued presence of the Lenape people in their homeland, we affirm the aspirations of the great Lenape chief Tanaman that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land. For as long as the rivers and creeks flow, and the sun and moon and stars shine. Wanishi, thank you. Wanishi Trinity, thank you. That was beautiful. Grounding. Um, okay. Uh, I'm, I now want to, um, we're going to move on now. Um, before I move on, I just want to let everybody know that you can check the chat for bios of the participating panelists, and also that we will be having a Q&A after the all panelists presents. So if you have any questions for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A, which is at the bottom, you know, you'll see it at the bottom of your screen, and not the chat. Um, okay. So um, Jane Gabriels, I'm so happy to welcome Jane Gabriels, a visiting scholar in residence at Temple University, Department of Dance. She is the executive director of Dance West Network, connecting artists and communities in motions in British Columbia, as well as director of Pepatian Bronx Arts Collaborative, where she has produced numerous projects, including women in hip hop, rep the Bronx, out of La Negrura, out of Blackness in the Bronx, Dancing La Botanica, and many more. And she has co-edited Curating Live Arts, Critical Perspectives, Essays, and Conversations um, on Theory and Practice, uh, Bergen Books 2018, and uh, like I said, please see, and many other um, publications. So please see her bio and those of the other panelists in the chat. So now, please, Jane, this is take it away. <laughs> thank you so much. The bio, that's all in the past. <laughs> but I really want to thank you so much um, for this invitation. And thank you, Marianne Soto, of course. And Trinity, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. It's really beautiful. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, 
So I wrote out everything I want to say because uh, my nerves are going to kick in in about a second. Um, so yeah, I wanted to think about possible curatorial inventions that might change up residency experiences. And I wanted to invite other artist curators working with indigenous artists and communities to share their practices. So this pandemic has brought up questions like what is touring? Why theaters? Um, so process itself has moved more into the center and conversations online are often all about process and community. So I wanted to talk about residencies as sites of process and to think with others what else a residency could do in the world. I was inspired by a conversation in November 2021 during the Dance in Vancouver platform with Margaret Grenier from BC and Charles Conorejo from New Zealand. In their conversation about dance as an act of living in legacy, they talked about how giving and receiving between host and visiting artist is a place of, woo, I lost my notes, reciprocity, Woo -hoo -hoo. and strengthening. We're going to play some video while I'm speaking. So, because we're so used to multitasking, we're bringing it into the experience. Um, right. And they were also talking about how to gather and how you meet and how you practice and is how, and it is how you practice inclusivity. Practice is intended to be there for one another. What energy is put into the practice to later be shared? How can we all emerge from a residency replenished? I'm going to put the link to that conversation in the chat as well, in case you want to look at it later. Um, and also a dance friend from Montreal, Karen Fennell asked, what is the value of dance when it is not performed in theater? How to engage with residencies for exploration and not to produce something, not building up to performance. Theaters are nice spaces too, not to knock them out completely, but works do not only have to be dependent upon them. We can turn again to dance as practice, to Marian Soto's performance practice, to branch dances in the park. In the Bronx, we think of the cipher, the dance circle of hip hop honed in community, its own residency before the work ever reaches a stage. So in my work in the Bronx and Vancouver, residencies is a common thread. So this is the residency in the Bronx and later you'll see residency artists from Vancouver. So I've worked at Pepetian in the Bronx, the ancestral lands of the Siwanoi Wikis Geek, since 1999. There I organized residencies outside of New York for artists making work in the borough, like Antonio Ramos at Lexington Center for the Arts, Cita Frederick, Marian Ramirez, and Rockefeller at Cornell University. In 2014, I started a residency in the Bronx to support emerging dance artists of color and or artists making work in the borough. This residency was inspired by conversations with artists like Marianne, Miltri Tucker, Concepcion, and Rockefeller. And we were able to produce this residency, Dancing Futures, in collaboration with the beautiful BAD, Bronx Academy of Arts and Dance. At the heart of this, mentorship, at the heart of this residency is mentorship. The artist is asked to invite a mentor to give feedback and support their process. The mentor can be a peer, colleague, director, choreographer. Artists all receive free rehearsal space and performance opportunities with documentation. And along the way, I added other elements. In 2017, dance artists were invited to bring in a writer of color to accompany their work. Last year, we published a book with three years of essays, and I'll put that link in the chat. Um, Let's see, we also, to help a few more Bronx-based artists, we offered resources to a small group who apply but who are not selected to help keep them encouraged and growing and applying again. This past year, artists needed to get out of New York and I organized a residency within this res residency at the Bethany Arts Community. And we have also been able to offer modest resources to residency project alumni, direct funds paying for workshops. One alumni artist, Fanna Frazier, became more involved with the residency structure over the past couple of years. So basically we've been building within the structure we set up, just keep replenishing. In the pandemic, of course, the format of this residency morphed in many positive directions. We had more time to offer each artist the experience that they needed to have. We didn't guide the residency as firmly in some ways. The artists needed this project and we needed to leave things open for them to access. We let go of some of the structure and let things, the projects, the artists, tell us what they needed next. And we had support from the funders. We wanna build on this more open format in the next two years of our guaranteed funding from the Jerome Foundation and hopefully continue into the future. In its near decade of existence, this residency has helped artists amplify their creative voices and development. So then when I got a job on the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Sailwithus Nations in so-called Vancouver in 2018, at the then Made in BC Dance on Tour organization, which is now renamed Dance West Network. 
one of the first things I, I one of the first things I started was a residency project for BIPOC dance artists. It had a similar format, surprise, as the Bronx residency, and included mentors and writers invited by the artists. In Vancouver, we were able to offer all the artists who applied some resources. Now at its third annual year, we're adding support for digital explorations. In 2021, I was able to start a residency in northern BC, a more rural area with its different needs, challenges, and pacing. I wanted to think about the kind of work that is happening in these two very, very different places, the Bronx and BC, which brought me to think more about residencies as a landing site for this conversation. I invited artist curators I have been meeting who focus on indigenous artists and communities and who don't really know each other that well already. This is also part of my practice I'm learning of community building and of sharing and moving knowledge across and around North America or Turtle Island. I wanted to learn more about their curatorial practices and ideas about residency creation to think about ways in which residencies are changing and or how they, become, how they could become different experiences for artists and for hosts. I'm also curious about how a residency is a practice for creative living. What does the work and what do artists need to evolve from a residency experience? Is the space held by both visiting guest artists and host? Is the residency indoors and or out of doors? Is it a place separate and away from home or can it be at home? Is it intergenerational? Is it relationship building with or within a community? In my creative work, I've been thinking about levitation which came from a sensation I was having as I kept one foot in the Bronx, working with collaborators there and started a new life in Vancouver. In the shifting of place, different things were growing that fed each other. And I felt slightly suspended from these energies meeting in my practices. So today's conversation is a continuation of that levitation. As Marianne will say, the dance of the future, which was from Pepo Anasorio's mentor Clemente Soto Vélez. Um, yeah, dance of the future is levitation. So, and in this conversation might bring you also into that sensation as we move from West to East Coast. I've been working with Garida de la Luz since the early 2000s and Lindsay for the past couple of years in Vancouver and have been in conversation with Ed more recently. So we are each in very different places of creating residencies for artists. So I wanted to welcome you to today's conversation about how curatorial, curatorial practices invent themselves. Um, and each speaker will have about eight to 10 minutes. And after each one, the other speakers will share a few words or a sentence about whatever caught their attention in that presentation. And then we'll see you after at the Q&A. Um, I said all that really fast. I hope you're all okay. I got revved up. Um, there are three questions that I began with and I'll put those in the chat. And um, I'm gonna put those in the chat right now so you have them. And the first person I'd like to introduce, I hope that was okay. It was a lot to take in all the dance at the same time, but we're so used to multi-layering. I thought, let's do it. Um, so the first speaker that I'm so happy to announce is Lindsay De La Ronde. Um, and I'm going to, I have a very short thing to say. I don't know if I have all the pronouns. Hi. <laughs> Lindsay's daughter's participating too, which we're thrilled. <laughs> So thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, I almost want to say the name of the nations that you're from, but I also don't have it memorized. I didn't review it with you as well. So Catahog, I don't know. I'm going to let you say it. So I don't, mess, I don't want to mess it up. Um, but the first question that we started with with Lindsay is how are your individual pathways as an artist with cur curatorial techniques, the result of community building? Like what's the connection between your work and community building? Mm -hmm. That was the first question. So thank you so much, Lindsay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. What good word I do? Sewaguego, Gazitaga, My English name is Lindsay Delarone. I am Ganyat Gahaga from Gahnawage, uh, which is situated just about 20 minutes outside of Montreal. That's uh, Mohawk territory. That's where I was born and raised. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Trinity for acknowledging the territory um, and giving us a little bit of that, that history. Um, and grounding us in acknowledging the power of earth where all this history is embedded in um, the land and the waters. And so um, really, I think the, the movement, the indigenous movement to really bring th that history forward and onward is so critical in terms of where we're at uh, in relationship to reconciliation here in Canada, 
uh, learning the true history of Canada, impacts of residential school, the 60s scoop, um, all of these historical events that have been hidden in the earth and in the water. And as you know, we come to literally unearthed children that were buried in residential schools, we are also unearthing more grief, more pain, more trauma, more history. And so, you know, art for me has been the vessel to really um, come to amends, to heal, to transform, to bring people together, yeah. to look, to analyze, to deconstruct, to change, to transform, and really, I think, create a better world through relationship. And so fundamentally, you know, coming through, uh, my own pathway, my own portal, coming from a very community-oriented uh, place like Gahnawage. Gahnawage is a very condensed community of about 10,000 Mohawks who reside on a very small piece of land, um, you know, in terms of what we've been able to salvage in this relationship with uh, the federal government who continued in our history to eradicate us from our places. Uh, Jage is the traditional name of Montreal as well, which was our traditional territory. And we are directly connected to the St. Lawrence River. That is our river. That is who we are named after. Gahnawage, which translates to people by the rapids. And um, the power of our relationship to water and river, I think, is something that's coming through in a lot of different ways. And our river used to be connected right to our land base. Back in the late 60s, they, the federal government came in and they created the Seaway Project, which pushed our river um, away from our river bank, and we are now connected to a seaway, so very large ships can um, yeah. vessel through our community to get to, I think it's Lake Erie yeah. from the Atlantic. And so that disconnect is something that I'm really interested in, in terms of community building, because we forget that land and water is such a central place to gathering. You know, the water, the river was a place of community building, of sharing, fishing, harvesting. And so when you take away those embodied practices of culture and sustainability and food and harvest, um, you know, for me, that's where dance is so powerful. You, you're able to revitalize, um, you know, these ways of moving and these ways of thinking that are really grounded in Indigenous epistemologies. And so fundamentally, I work that way. I work with Indigenous knowledges. I revive Indigenous knowledges um, and really coming to terms with contemporary practice as well. And knowing that the traditional and contemporary practices are so much cyclical. One, one minute, honey. Um, just give me one second. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of start off with that. And um, in terms of my, my, my place of my birth, you know, that's sort of the worldview that I, that I carry. And so everywhere I go in the world, I carry those values of deep relationship, uh, respecting that I am a guest on other people's territory, wanting to, you know, um, learn about the history of places and spaces that I go. And so when I moved to British Columbia, uh, I lived in Vancouver for a couple of years, and then I've been residing on the Kwangan territory, Victoria, British Columbia, for the last uh, 15 years or so. And so my Indigenous epistemologies and my understanding of uh, community and place land-based knowledge systems has really been impacted by the Lekwungen people here, the new channels of the West Coast and the Kokokyuak people from the northern tip of the island. And so, you know, there's an expansive knowledge systems all at play that now reside within my body. And so I really like to acknowledge that, that the knowledge isn't from me. The knowledge is an accumulation of all of these knowledge systems that my body has interacted with. I've been collaborated for many years with many different artists. Um, and so that's community, you know, for me, that's community. The way that I was shaped, how I talk, that's community. You know, I'm only one person, but I've been, I've worked and collaborated, mentored, 
Um, and we all know how precious our creative practices are and how uh, invested and personal they are. And so they shape us. They shape the way that we see the world. They shape the way that we see ourselves. Um, and so back in 2017, I was the very first Indigenous artist in residence for this city. They wanted to do a program it was marked under the year of reconciliation. And so they have a public committee that formed this residency for an artist to come and make art really focus on civic engagement. And so the two years that I became the artist in residence there, there was many challenges. City Hall is not an indigenous, um, you know, centralized space that functions with indigenous epistemologies. Um, you know, a city hall is not an art space organization or institution that can really um, know how in the beginning stages of developing these programs really know how to function as um, or really know how to collaborate with artists in that sense. And so the, the city of Victoria since then has grown a lot in terms of artist engagement, civic engagement. And so the, the possibilities of residencies that are centralized in cities that have an indigenous person there, I think is a very powerful, um, a powerful position to have. They were so only supposed to run this program one year and then extended it to two and they were gonna close this program. And I had said at a, at a public artist talk, I said, they're gonna close down this uh, artist in residence for an indigenous person. The whole city came together and advocated for that to be a permanent position. Uh, in the city of Victoria. So residencies could be powerful that way. So I just wanted to share that for anybody who's listening and thinking through, you know, these ideas of um, residencies for cities and what that looks like. Um, I know they just started one in Edmonton as well. So when I left the artist in residence, uh, after two years, I was really invested in site specific site-specific performance art in an Indigenous theatre. I developed a relationship with the Belfry Theatre here in Victoria, and we are four years into creating Indigenous theatre here in Victoria, British Columbia, that does not exist here. There is very little cultural spaces. There are very little places where cultural revitalization is at the heart of um, institutions and organizations. And so um, that development is also in process in terms of my relationship to other artists, engaging, you know, and working with uh, theater here in Victoria. In 2019, I really took that uh, reflection and that gap, and I started a collective called the Visible Bodies Collective. Dance Victoria is a, um, a dance institution here who uh, developed the relationship back in 2017 for rehearsal spaces for earlier Indigenous theater productions. And so Stephen White, who was the executive director there at the time, he said, Lindsay, he's like, I'm going to give you more space. So for the last three years, Dance Victoria has, uh, we've been in residence at Dance Victoria uh, with resource support, studio support, um, the option, option of filming our work and helping us archive our process has been critical. And in that time, in the three years that we've developed this residency, it's grown from four indigenous women to about 13 BIPOC uh, women. And so there's people from the African black diaspora, uh, from Brazil, um, a lot of mixed coming in from different cultures, uh, even settler identities, and really about embracing a residency space that offers a circle where we all belong trying to develop a practice that is inclusive, that is intercultural, um, is really, I think, the focus and using our bodies as the main vehicle of addressing social political issues, embracing and celebrating our indigeneity, our global indigeneity, and really coming together to think through creatively how do we work collaboratively with these complex identities coming together. So that's where we're at today. And I wanted to share um, our last piece that we did last summer called Mother Tongue. And it's about the vibration of the earth and how language developed from the earth. We all came from different um, language origins. And so a lot of us have been also disconnected from our language of origin through the residential school migration, uh, disconnect from land community. And so mother tongue is about the 
connecting back to the earth and its land vibrations and really about the reclamation of the female body through this relationship of of learning language again and announcing those phonetics and embodying those sounds um, so I'll share a little bit about that. So I wanted to say that in terms of residencies is the longevity of them. So not just short spurts of here, you get your studio for three weeks, but there's something to be said and had, as I was mentioning the residency for a city, this residency in the dance um, institutions, the longevity of it, it really allows legacy and growth to happen. So I just want to say that for anybody who's thinking through in terms of residencies. Um, and I'm almost at my time. So I'm just going to share the last bit of mother tongue and, uh, and then that will be that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had two of them. Oh gosh, which one should I play? Okay, I'll play Mother Tongue. You're muted, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, that, that place um, was for the Outdoor Scampede uh, fil uh, Festival, Outdoor Festival. We had got there on a Friday and they had told us, oh, you gotta perform this 23 times. <laughs> and so we ran that every 
10 minutes for the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so this embodiment of doing this piece over and over and over and over and doing it on the land like that, it was so powerful. And then we had, there was two giant totem poles right at that place because that place was really sacred to the Lekwungen people. It was, uh, it, I, don't, I forget the native name of it, but it translated to like uh, where they cradle, where they make a cradle board. And these elders had come together and they created these poles to signify uh, language revitalization. So we didn't even know that when we brought that piece over there, the power of place-based knowledge systems that are directly aligned with the artistic vision, I think can be really powerful too, because they assert that um, Indigenous people's presence and knowledge systems are deeply, deeply ingrained in the ecology in the waters, in the land, in the stars, in the trees. That is so much a part, I think, of acknowledging when you are not from that place. Um, and so that's the, where my heart sits when, I, when I'm a guest here, when I'm a visitor here. My children are from different nations as well. And so as a Mohawk woman, it's really pivotal for me to maintain the respect for myself and the integrity to my own indigenous knowledge systems and be present and uh, mindful and open to to receiving and witnessing um, other indigenous people's practice. So with that, I'll close and just say Nyawakoa for your time. Thank you so much. I'm telling you, it's a good thing we are recording this because we're all going to have to re-listen to it again. There's so much knowledge. It's like, wait, I got to get trying to, um, let's just, I'm going to put Lindsay's bio in the chat. So we have that there. And I wanted to ask, I wanted to invite Ed or Gerida to maybe share a word or a phrase that kind of stood out to you from Lindsay's um, present, like, presentation. I felt it was very moving that they were dancing at the totem poles, you know, that and their movement and what they were doing. Like, I got, it I I got, Thank you, Karida. I got my back in here. It also strikes me that um, being on the land in a place that we think is um, silent, we're distracted by so, silence is impossible anymore. I find myself hearing the, 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 the helicopter yeah. and hearing the, the truck drive by. But then also being aware, and, and I think we, if we listen with all of our senses, we see the, the, the squirrel that was on the fence behind you when you were talking, the birds flying through the video, all of the other communication that's happening, and we're stuck on one thing. I'd like to thank you for having your daughter with you. Yeah. Because it's a really important thing um, that, you know, it was only when Richard Wagner turned down the lights and insisted that we all be silent in the theater, uh, that, that that idea of what performance is became our standard. And yet this is what community is. This is what, uh, in, in Indigenous communities, you should be ready for a child to walk across the stage in the middle of your performance or and that is a part of the total experience just like all of these other relatives these other animals that are that are around us and listening and watching and and communicating um, is part of the community the community that we strive for right yeah, yeah thank you Ed. thank you so much i just yeah i love the i was just thinking about vibration when you mentioned that earth vibration i've been thinking about that yeah, check out Lindsay's new website. <laughs> it's brand new. It's very exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much again. That was really beautiful. And I will be listening to this recording. Um, I wanted to, next up is Gerida de la Luz. And I put her bio in the chat. I'm getting better at this. Um, and Gerida is based in the Bronx, but I'm going to let her introduce herself as she likes. And thank you so much for being here, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jane Gabriels who has supported my work, you know, for just about two decades now. Um, my name is Caridad de la Luz. That's my given name. My Taino name is Gachianao. It means sunflower of the sacred mountain. Uh, I am a Taino woman. Um, my family was displaced by colonization on the island of what you know as 
Puerto Rico. Uh, in Taino, it is Boriquen. And I'm the first generation born here in the United States. I am presently living and, uh, well, all of my life, I'm born, raised, and live on uh, what are the territorial lands of the Siwanoi. Um, this area in particular is called Soundview in the Bronx, um, but it was called Snakapins. It was the land between two waters. And um, I only learned that this was the name and that it was Siwanoi uh, people that lived here within the last three years that I learned this, though I've lived here my entire life. And the way that I got to that point was um, as I continued to search about my Taino people and um, in doing gatherings here in New York City um, of Taino people, that led me to um, when I, I applied for a grant uh, for the Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship and I won it. And using that money, I was able to travel to British Columbia, to Vancouver, and to Haida Gwaii. Uh, thanks to Jane Gabriel's, uh, we went together. And I learned protocol and practices of the Haida people and saw the similarities and traditions that um, are in the Taino. And uh, that led me to a name, led me to another thing, which was, you know, all connected. But before getting to that point, I started performing poetry. I'm a spoken word artist. That is my foundation. And dance is part of my foundation as well. Um, I started learning flamenco, ballet, tap, jazz, modern, African, and of course, salsa, merengue, uh, all the Latin uh, dances. Um, because my mother is a dancer, my parents met dancing salsa, and so if it weren't for salsa, I wouldn't even be alive. If it weren't for dance, I would not be here. <laughs> um, but I was put into dance classes since the age of four, every Saturday throughout my life up until the age of 13, when I was diagnosed with scoliosis, which is the curvature of the spine, and, uh, and I had to have surgery. I have two metal rods in my spine. I was in a body cast for three months and I was told that I would never dance again, that I would never do sports, that um, I wouldn't be able to carry children. And once that cast came off, I never looked back and uh, I have been in musicals. Uh, I have been sport teams, done tennis, volleyball. I have two beautiful children. My son is 23 right now. My daughter's 21. Um, and though I didn't pursue dance um, the way that I intended to pursue it, spoken word was what was also part of my life because my great-grandmother, my maternal great-grandmother, was a poetess. She did not read or write, but she knew how to recite, and her, she had a memory of gold, and I was raised with her. My grandmother raised us both to while she took care of her mother and took care of her granddaughter i was sitting with my great grandmother from the years of three four and five learning poetry from her and performing poetry in the living room in my when, with my family so i began performing poetry um very very young i was doing what we now call open mics in my living room i was holding court <laughs> and uh, my family would perform. We were all dancers, but the poetry was something that I also also supported me and carried me and was one of my passions. Um, then um, in 1996, April 3rd, 1996, I was told of a place called the New Yorican Poets Cafe. And New Yorican is actually what they call uh, me, us Puerto Ricans in New York, New Yorican, um, though I am I am first born New Yorican. My parents came as uh, like three years old, four years old from Puerto Rico, from Boriquen. Um, so yeah, I'm first generation New Yorican, Puerto Rican. But um, going to the New Yorican Poets Cafe in 1996 was where I found the poetry community and learned of this cultural institution um, that, was, that was born out of uh the need to speak the pain of being displaced the missing of the homeland the trying to comprehend colonization racism patriarchy 
Um, and so at the New Yorican Poets Cafe, I began po doing my poetry there and then it extended into a one woman show. I started performing one woman shows. Then I continued my hip hop because I'm born in the boogie down Bronx. I was also, you know, while I was absorbing ballet, salsa and all of those traditions, I was also on the, in the streets and in school learning the hip hop traditions, um, doing backspins on cardboard in the sidewalk and, uh, you know, learning of what, you know, each one teach one and the power of the MC. And so all of those things basically came out in my art. Uh, I chose to call myself La Bruja, that is my poetry name, um, because my parents got married on Halloween and La Bruja, it means the witch. And because we were, I was baptized Catholic, but we still practiced um, indigenous ways of healing and celebrating and, um, and remembrance. So there was always these two worlds and somehow I took all of those worlds and joined them within myself as one and presented them. Um, and by calling myself La Bruja at the time, I, there was no word, we didn't call it decolonization, but I knew that that was my way of decolonizing minds when they thought of, uh, women divine women in, in their divine feminine and their you know matriarchs and their power um powers to heal you know and um now 25 years later at the new york and poets cafe i was recently appointed as the executive director interim executive director of this cultural establishment where i came out of um <laughs> which it's less than a month and it's, I'm absorbing two roles uh, at the cafe, the executive director and the general manager. So I'm learning about the house and structure itself, as well as um, using what I was doing uh, for grant writing and, and things like that to, to, for the cafe. But before even that, I have, uh, since I've been living in the Bronx in on Siwanoi territory here my whole life, behind my house is a 1920 trucking garage that my father bought in the 1980s. And my father uh, was a hoarder. And um, so it was full of things my entire life, unusable. And my father then returned to Puerto Rico to live. My mother and I, we stayed here and I cleaned it out. It took a year. And um, that's where I started learning about grant writing um, to help create um, a gathering center in El Garaje, in the garage. Um, then the pandemic happened. And though I did win several grants that helped, um, the pandemic basically put a stop to you know that process and then led me to have to re help the New York and Poets Cafe in recovery from the pandemic. So um, throughout all of these years of performing, it started at the New York and Poets Cafe, but then it extended into houses like Pregones Theater and the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater and working with the Caribbean Culture Center and then working on the island of Boriquen with the Poets Passage and Casa Afro. Um, and, you know, I, every time I would go every summer with my children to Boriquen and visit sacred uh, ceremonial sites of the Taino and learned as much as I could and realized just how underrepresented the Taino people and the culture are even on the island, you know, and the this whitewashing does continue. So part of my activism is to uh, get land back, uh, to get our artifacts back. Um, and I feel like this this position with the New York and Poets Cafe is one step closer toward land back, you know, but here on, I guess, I think the New York and Poets Cafe is located on Lenape land um, here in the Bronx in Soundview, Sibuinoy. Um, but I'm looking to extend and be able to return back and to Boriquen. And I'm hoping to regain somehow El Yunque, which is the, the, the rainforest, which has just been bought. Um, I somehow with all of these communities uh, and this work, you know, intend and am 
creating awareness. Um, but it's all one step at a time. And being invited to perform my poetry and to perform monologues and to perform and speak um, throughout these 25 years has expanded uh, my reach and my community. Um, but it, it still continues here uh, on, in Snackapins in the Bronx. We had already begun in conjunction with Dr. Jane Gabriels and Pepatian, uh, indigenous gatherings, yearly indigenous gatherings. And we had already done, I believe, two before I went to Haida Gwaii. When I went to Haida Gwaii uh, was when I returned, learning that where we were doing the gatherings was actually a Siwanoi village with 70 wigwams and that, you know, like an archaeological site in the 1900s. My, like, I, we are on, like literally on, not just another area in the Bronx, like literally. It said Leland Avenue and I am on Leland Avenue. Um, so the first video that I would like to share with you was about, to, it's, it's one year old, it's almost two years old after learning that this was uh, Siwanoi territory and uh, wanting to um, bring awareness to that fact and awareness of the indigenous people of the Bronx and how the river itself was, you know, what connected us over time. Um, this was a video that I made and um, this was before what it is. I will show you, you know, where we got to do the next thing. And this is class in point, the place that I've always come to when I wanna be close to the river. For the Siwanoi, this was a place of bubbling activity during the warm season. They would come here and collect clams and fish. This was where they had a huge resource of food. And this is the other place where we would like to acknowledge the Siwanoi and possibly put a placard or a bench or some artistic monument in memory of that Native American history. River, after 100 years of industrial pollution and after 400 years of colonization, relies on us to keep our indigenous history, culture, and natural namesake alive. Organizations Pepatian, Pregones Theater, and the Bronx River Alliance have come together in support of the work being done by Roderick Bell, Cynthia Paniagua, Mario Figueroa, and myself. To better understand the importance of the history, the culture, and the river itself, one must become one with all three. become keepers of our truth and reconnect to an ancestral way the Bronx River awaits. <laughs> so that video was actually my first um, documentary video because during the pandemic I started making videos um, and that was my first and it is on YouTube Bronx Indigenous. 
um, Alejandra Ocasio Cortez shared it when I first made it and gave it 50, you know, there was 50,000 views on Instagram, um, which I was just so happy, you know, and you'll see if you watch the entire video, what I'm also um, highlighting is how African, um, how Africans and uh, indigenous Native Americans um, came together as well, that they are not separate, that many times um, they were told not to acknowledge one or the other because separated is how, you know, divide and conquer is, is how colonization works. <clears throat> what I learned also <clears throat> is that dance was you know, though with the, with a, you know ballet teaching and all the structural and theater teachings, what I learned really that dance is ceremonial. It is a way to connect. It is with spirit. It's how to exercise the spirit. It's how to acknowledge ancestors. So dance has a much bigger uh, uh, strength than it's even you know given. <laughs> um, so it's not just performance, it's actually, you know, remembrance, it's connection, it's spiritual. Um, what I also learned is that, you know, uh, my role and what I'm hoping people see themselves as is our stewards of land, you know, the stewards of the land. What, by calling this land Snackapins, uh, the description was the land between two waters. They didn't call it, oh, this is, this is Siwanoi River, or this is, they weren't calling it names of themselves. They called it names of its description. It was not owned, you know, it was kept. It was upkept, right, you know? So I'm um, hoping that um, people will see themselves as stewards instead of, uh, you know, owners. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going over time. One more video that I would like to share is uh, just a few months ago, um, we actually did a ceremony at the water's edge. And, um, and this is a video uh, showing of that. Thank you so much, Gedad. I put in the chat like some links to different things that Gedad had mentioned, so you can take a look. Um, I wanted to ask Lindsay and Ed if what what kind of word or phrase that kind of came to you. Oh my God, a lot. I'll just say so. I'll just but uh, this um, occupying territory. Yeah, just give me one minute. Um, this occupying territory, like being on the land, engaging with the land, it really is about the assertion of the steward, this relationship. I love that. The power of the matriarch leadership as, um, you know, women in leadership in these roles is so critical to the um, mobilization of land back. You need people that are leading the way and so i just wanted to acknowledge that as well i wanted to acknowledge the indigenous and the black relationship just as there's so many complexities around race but there's victory narratives that i just want to really highlight that you know the the deep relationships that go back in that history and um this dance as ceremony is so powerful because it's it's so true and i also want one more thing the anti-dance restrictions and the anti-potluck restrictions were from 1885 to 1951 
And 10 years later, indigenous people were allowed to vote in Canada. And so that's not a long time ago. And so dance needs to be at the center and center of everything that we do. That's it. Thank you, Caddy. That it was beautiful. For me, two things. One is it, both artists have talked about the river, the importance of the river in, in, in connecting us to all the generations. Uh, actually, Trinity mentioned that as well. And then both of you have spoken about um, about the artist, uh, not as, as the creator, but as the conduit. And that's an important value and important um, thing to consider, ponder. Great, thank you so much. I was thinking about the accumulation of knowledge systems that Lindsay mentioned and Gary Dow with like from salsa to hip hop to brr, 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 all of it as community. That's great. Um, to move it along next up, to beautifully move it along in a leisurely, wonderful pace, because <laughs> we're fine. But Ed Bourgeois, and I will put your bio in the chat. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ed Bourgeois. My family is French Canadian and also Ganingahaga or Mohawk uh, descendant. I am a descendant. I, I don't claim um, to be Native American, but a, a descendant, like many of us, are, are, are very mixed and very mixed up. Um, with roots in Ganawage, actually, also. Um, I am one of those people who never lived in community. Uh, for various reasons that I won't go into, but never lived in community. And um, a lot of us in Canada and the United States, what are now called Canada and the United States, are, uh, are, are living with that, um, with, with that being taken away, that, that removal um, and, and its, its effect on the generations beyond. I'm calling from traditional homelands of bands of Chinook, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Multnomah, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and Malala peoples from the confluence of the Columbia River and the Willamette River in what is now called Portland, Oregon. And my, my bio, don't even bother looking at my bio, it's really, <laughs> it's really old and, and um, one important thing that's not there is the work that I do now, which is I'm the program manager for a program called Advancing Indigenous Performance at Western Arts Alliance, which is located here in Portland and, and why I'm here. In the last five years, I've been sort of working my side gig has been trying to create this thing called Native Artist Residencies and I and um, and work with whatever organization I happen to be working with uh, to to, to build the concept and to build partnerships that make it happen. Um, here at Western Arts Alliance in the AIP program, we also do have currently a residency program, an indigenous residency series that came about because of the pandemic and because we needed to, um, we needed to repurpose funds that had been allocated to us for, uh, for touring. Uh, the Western Arts Alliance is a membership organization of presenters, sort of like APAP is out of out of uh, DC and New York, which um, you may be familiar with, of performing arts presenters and managers and artists. So it's really all about touring. And the pandemic has shut that down, as you can all imagine. Um, and, and being in the dance world, you know that as well. Um, Advancing Indigenous Performance is uh, a program for serving Indigenous artists, for giving them career development tools, uh, build, helping them build networks that will create sustainable careers for them in the performing arts and remove barrier, barriers for Indigenous uh, performers. Uh, same thing that applies to BIPOC artists you know, in, in, in the world that we're in now. Um, uh, and we serve Indigenous artists. Um, the first thing I come to here is, is uh, in my ignorance coming into the, uh, I come from a theater background, um, and so uh, coming into a place where we're serving dance artists, we're serving uh, multidisciplinary artists, uh, music artists, musical artists, um, 
is what is what actually is a residency because I had a particular conception of what a residency was and to me that was that place that you go to uh, in solitude to create something uh, th that's the image that I had you know from from writers residencies or visual artists residencies this idea that they go off into the woods and in that quiet they can actually create something brand new uh, also the idea and I've experienced this in my work is artists coming together in collaboration so what is it when artists co-locate and they may be from different disciplines and there's that spark that happens when 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 the orbits sort of uh, intersect that's another kind of residency then in in the the touring world in this uh, in this in the Western Arts Alliance what I've run into is uh, a completely different conception of what residency is. It, when, when a presenter engages an artist to come in to do a performance where they sell tickets, they'll also say, well, we'll come in a few days early for a residency. And um, they perform a residency. And I use that verb very deliberately because in what my belief, in a lot of those contexts, it's still a transactional, it's really about selling tickets. And so the artist comes in and goes out into community, into underserved communities uh, to, to present, to make connection, but it's really about maybe selling some, some low price tickets to that community and, and still getting them to, to become part of the audience. Um, still kind of transactional. And, and then there are artists and the trend that's happening in the work that, that we are doing um, with indigenous artists and, and our our Western Arts Alliance connections go internationally. So we have colleagues in Australia, in Aotearoa, in, Canada, in, in First Nations, in Canada. Um, a lot of folks are talking about sort of breaking that, um, that mold a little bit and making it less transactional. So what does it mean for artists to actually do their work in community? And that may mean in their communities or in communities where they are guests. And those things may, uh, you know, involve thinking about engaging more local artists, lowering the carbon footprint of, you know, of touring, but also of what does a residency mean? Do you bring someone from another country? Do you bring someone from across the country when you have people in the Lanai Lenape community who might benefit from, from, from your resources and what you have to offer? Um, so all those things are leading to a new way of thinking and it's a great opportunity with the social upheaval that's going on it's a great opportunity to jump in and say let's think about the possibility of some different ways of doing this um, and indigenous artists i don't speak for all you know i don't speak for anyone but myself but the artists that i serve what i've seen and although it's not universal there's no generalization here but a lot of indigenous artists have unique needs and, and, and the whole reason that I got involved in, in residencies was an artist that I spoke to who was an indigenous playwright, a Diné playwright, who went to a very prestigious residency, you know, one of these with a mansion, uh, you know, on a, on a, on a, a property, a plantation, a whatever, uh, you know, in the Catskills or, or in Chicago, wherever, you know, one of these major residencies that you have heard of for writers was the only, uh, may have been the only person of color there, but certainly was the only indigenous person there. And, and they said that they spent the entire time being the exotic, being the other, and this is not unique to indigenous artists. So this applies to all BIPOC artists who may find themselves the only person of color in the room and in a place where community is supposedly being created and spent their entire time fielding questions about of indigenous culture and about and and not actually being able to do any of their own work and 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 so really uh, you know appreciating the opportunity appreciating what's being offered but also realizing that they have needs that are better um, that are better addressed when the hosts have a more cultural competency when the hosts don't have just the, the the great intentions but actually understand that there are some needs that they may have they may have and all of the questions that Jane put out there in the chat to me they all have to do with protocols and relationships what's your relationship to the host uh, what's your relationship as an artist when you come in to the home community 
if you go to Philadelphia and you're not connecting with the Lanai Lenape community, something will really be missing for you as an indigenous artist. You will need access to materials. That means that means you know being able to be on the sea, on the shore, on the in the woods, uh, relating to all the other relatives, not just the human relatives, but whether it's the river or the trees or the uh, all of those things. Uh, maybe a specific need for indigenous artists, access to elders, to that it, the embodiment that's being talked about, what you're sort of sucking up out of the land and, and putting back out, is you have to be able to access that. Uh, and, and again, not a generalization. That's not to say that indigenous artists won't once in a while want to, you know, there will be artists that want, uh, you know, a uh, uh, a solo experience in a loft in isolation or somewhere in a lighthouse where no one bothers them yeah we're all we're all different but as a rule some of the values that guide indigenous artists need to be addressed um, if you would let's let's show uh, the pilot that we were able to do for um, a, a pilot for native artist residencies occurred in 2019 just before the the pandemic and this is the sort of model that we are hoping to um, to talk about we are here for 10 days in residence with a group of four artists and a director and you you're right here and go ahead Indigenous artists come here and feel a kind of access to a deep sense of place. We live together and we get to know each other and we tell each other stories and we sing and dance and cry and talk about our hopes and dreams. Native artists have particular needs when they go into community or go into a residency situation to do their work. We want to honor those things and help both the artists to have the tools in their toolbox to work in different communities, but really more specifically for those communities, the artist residencies that want to host Native artists, to have the vocabulary and understanding of the protocols, really the cultural competency to be good hosts for Native artists. I want to be able to have interaction with other Indigenous people, and I would hope that a residency would somehow you know, make that available, or at least know that that's something that I want to do um, as part of why I'm there. You know, a meeting, um, a way to somehow give something back to the people whose homeland I'm on. It's just an honor and a privilege yeah. to be here, to be part of this. The work's been deep and the work's been challenging, but it's easy to work with everybody. The things that we are exploring in this pilot are preparing an organization's board and staff with what we call cultural competency training. We spent a day training doing cultural competency workshops, and that included talking about decolonization and indigenization. So it's really a great circle of learning that occurs when these cultural competency classes happen. Doing that training, building those relationships, establishing a groundwork, sets the artist that then comes in, sets them up to really have a good experience. In the process of doing this work with artists and learning more about land acknowledgement and the deep importance of place in supporting artists' work, it's transforming our organization. We essentially realize these opportunities to really strengthen our networks, to know our stories and to share our stories.
Thank you, Lori. So, um, in closing, I would just um, I would just try to connect the questions that were asked a little bit with um, with my belief that those questions are all connected by relationships, by protocols, um, how we uh, how we make space for for interactions that are needed by indigenous people. Um, and the acknowledgement of the community in which you're a guest and we're all guests. Uh, the Asia Freeman in that, in that little video just said uh, that land acknowledgement and working with land has transformed the organization. It's really about the acknowledgement of those things that has transformed their organization and, and can tr transform any presenting or any residency organization. So I'll stop there because I'm sure there are going to be some great questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. We're, we have 15 minutes. We're good. Um, I want to thank you so much, Ed. And just very quickly, Lindsay or Garida, just one word or something that came to you listening to Ed's presentation. Well, you know, when he said that he was mixed, you know, I, I understand, you know, the feeling of, uh, you know, the feel, feeling mixed and because you also followed by mixed up. A lot of us are feel confused about, you know, um, you know, who are we that quest of of connecting. So, you know, that that definitely uh, resonated with me and then rethinking residency after thinking about traveling and having to travel. Now I feel like I actually have to stay here and like I said, and be a steward of this, this space and have and, and invite people here to share instead of me leaving. <laughs> so just rethinking. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, I think the conversation really uh, addressed a critical question that I think a lot of hosts need to ask themselves in terms of what are these bar barriers, right? What is the relationship? What is the protocols? What is the relationship to the local territory and the stewards of that land? Um, really trying to think through as organization, a nonprofit, an institution, an individual residency creator, whatever it is, I think looking through the lens of dismantling the pre-existing structure that is uh, perpetuates white supremacy, um, exclusion of people of color, um, and the perpetuating of, I think, mostly of marginalized communities in relationship to engaging with dance, dancers, performing arts. Um, and I think residencies that think through these um, really critical questions um, the imagery that I saw in your video was so powerful because it shows the diversity, it shows range, it shows different color, different bodies, different ages. And so when we could create atmospheres and creative atmospheres that allows for multiple truths to be heard, seen, felt, and witnessed, I think is very powerful. And you've inspired me to create a residency that looks like that feels like that yeah so thank you no thank you so much yeah that was beautiful um oh that's nice so julie fingerish wrote these presentations have been beautiful and fascinating thanks so much for the work that you do oh she asked a question what kind of support do you seek from the general public for your work that's a big open question but that's a nice one that's a juicy one <laughs> if you could have anything you could choose one thing. What okay, you... just a recent experience. So the residency at Dance Victoria does an event called Rough Cuts. So they invite all of their residencies who are in residency to show a 10 minute either clip of a piece they're working on, a process that they're working on. And so the collective, the Visible Bodies Collective shared a 10 minute performance, mainly improvised from some exercises that we did and some uh, previous sessions and then we create sort of a framework for that but they had offered in terms of this rough cut structure 
the invitation for audience to give any type of feedback um, about the work. It doesn't really translate though in that context because you know how Q and A's work right after the performance and then they get you to speak and then everybody's like, you know, kind of in that place of not knowing how to share or what to share, but it was really beautiful because we had a young person in the audience. They might've been 13 years old. And this young person said, I know what your performance is about. And they just summed it up so beautifully. And so sometimes that invitation to audience could be successful. And I think it also leaves room for alternative voices to, to, to impact like that example of that young person being in the audience. Um, one also thing, is the audience responsibility in terms of reception, you know, and I think it kind of relates to Ed, what you're talking about, cultural competency, you know, making sure that when you, before you go witness something that you do have some sort of self-location within yourself in terms of the themes that are being talked about, meaning very well knowledgeable, not knowledgeable, knowledgeable at all, or I have some relationship to these toxic topics or themes and I think that's an audience responsibility to, to be part of theater and performance education with, with a component of education. Just, yeah, there's a lot to say, but I'll stop there. I agree with that completely. I think that the, it, this, it's a hard one, but the general public has to demand that the paradigm shift and that can be very difficult because it's easy to stay for for people who are who are who are uh, raised in the in a white society who are white appear white uh, you know th this country is about assimilation about erasing all of our differences and um, and that's affected all of us and that's created this sort of you know, this sort of uh, homogeneous way of thinking that is not necessarily the truth. And the public needs to say, okay, I want to experience different things. I want to challenge the way I may have been educated or raised. Um, life could be pretty interesting to find out what other pe how other people are, you know, uh, how people who actually have preserved the earth for thousands of years, um, may have some advice about climate, the climate crisis, right? Uh, it's it, the, the public needs to say, uh, this isn't just an, a, 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 an argument between peoples, between, this is for all of us. This, this uh, and, and the audience should be hungry for new things. The audience should be hungry for new ways of thinking, you know, otherwise, what are we doing? Because the crisis is at our door. You know, and it's it, you can't do the same thing the same way and expect a different result. You want to save the earth. You want uh, you you know you want to experience different things. Um, you can't just you know phone them or ship them in from other places and then ship them home. You know we've got to be in this together, and we've got to demand that. Um, uh, I hate to get into a class in capitalism, you know, to, to go there, but that's really what it's about. It's, it's, it's a class issue and we have to demand that, that, that we can all share, um, you know, what's out there and not let certain folks determine what we all see. Look at the, look at the, 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 the brouhaha over the Super Bowl, uh, the, the Super Bowl halftime show, you know? My God, it's it was. When's the last time that an entire program was was all people of color? Uh, and for how many years did those people of color wonder where are we? Where are we here? Don't just just put on the other shoe. Just put on the other shoe and 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 experience life, all of life. Well, what was interesting about that is that then the one white rapper took the knee. You know, he, you, we need allyship. We need allies. We need uh, support in that way uh, to, um, to continue. I mean, now, of course, that I'm in this position at the New York and Poets Cafe, what I'm hoping to do is use funding to pay the artists 
and uh, and also make the programming free where it's not about ticket sales, where it can be offered. You know, I'm right now, this Friday, we'll be presenting my uh, next one woman show from poor to rico. And it's because of the help of organization Pepa Tiang and Ostos and Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship and the New York City uh, mm -hmm. Council of mm -hmm. Arts or of cultural affairs using these grants and grant money to present work for free. So I'm presenting this performance and it's reservation, uh, you know, it's reserved tickets, it's not sold, you know, so that we can offer the programming to the community, highlight artists that, you know, or activists that are in the community that people don't know, bring them out, you know. So part of that curation, right, is like, and it, doing the community work realizing who, like I just learned today about Tiffany and, and the Lenape um, connection in New Jersey, which is very close. I didn't know that it exists. So even this moment helped expand my community and my outreach and who I will speak to and who I will call upon and, you know, to help further the work. So, um, you know, and if you want to make a financial contribution to Pepatian, you know, visit pepatian.org. These organizations that are doing tremendous work, newyorican.org slash contribute so that we can do this programming, pay, you know, pay these artists, activists to do the work and, and provide it for free. Thank you so much. I'm quickly trying to like, put chats and like links and chats and everything um gosh there's so much uh there was something in the q a median did you oh there you are excellent hi hi thank you so much this was this has been really wonderful um so there's something in the q a from jan hanvik i don't know if it's so much a question but <laughs> We did it's um, it says uh, the Panzingo Ecology Center and Artist Residency in San Juan Nuevo Parangari, Parangaricutiro, Michoacan, Mexico, with whom I have a 30 year relationship is 100% an initiative of the Puerhepecha people who are still largely in control of their ancestral lands and waters. Their definition of the essential point about how it works is that artists apply with a project. A, a comisariado of 12 Puerchepecha decides whether the soul of the project fits with the soul of Panzingo. Then it goes ahead or not. For example, the residency idea went ahead. Installation of Wi Fi is not going ahead. Hello, old friends, Jane, Midian, and Ed, and new friends. So I don't know if anybody, if you want to say something to Jan. Well, I would like to say, I, I, I loved that they're looking for the soul in the project, you know, um, moving forward with the New York and Poets Cafe, uh, what I would like to do is, you know, maintain um, that it be a cultural institution that we don't just put what whoever can afford to rent out the stage that's how it's been in the past i want to make sure that every performance and everything that we bring and house in in the new york and poets cafe is in alignment with the mission of the founders of the cafe with in alignment with uh you know indigenous indigeneity uh blackness uh, celebrating those cultures um, and the LGBTQ uh, community, the two spirit. Um, so yeah, really curating what is brought by uh, acknowledging the soul. I love that, and you know that that is certainly my intention. Hi, Jan. Thank you for that, and and I think it's it's a great example of um, of an organization being responsive or being um, a byproduct of the community of what is right for that land and the and the and the people um, not parachuting in something from Europe that may have no connection or or no um, no relationship or you know no impact beyond uh, you know the fine arts people who will be appreciating that curation for themselves but not what it does for the land and the people. Uh, and, and then, you know, the other, 
an extension of the other question about what can the public do, what can organizations do? Um, organizations who do not have this connection, it's really hard work. It can be, it can be really hard work, but you have to make yourself open to, to creating a relationship. And then, and then very often what's happening for large institutions, which have been well funded and don't necessarily have these relationships, it's about um, giving up power. So mm -hmm. if you have, you have a building, you have a venue, you have resources, you have all of these things, uh, don't bring in BIPOC artists and curate what they do. Bring them in and give them the resources, give them the space, give them, give them funding. Go for it, do what you will and, and, and curate it yourself or your community curate it and see what happens. Because that's, uh, you know, we're all blessed to, to, to have whatever funding that we have. And, and that's a system that we've all learned to negotiate. But uh, sharing that can be a really, really powerful beginning. Thank you, Ed. I was just, I was thinking about that, like what cultural competencies does do hosts of Native American artists or other people, what do they need to um, develop? And I think you have just answered part of it, you know, giving up the power and letting them, um, giving access to resources, I think is a really important point. Um, I think um, it's four o'clock, so I think we kind of have to um, wrap it up. Um, I want to thank all of the panelists and also Trinity uh, for her wonderful welcome and grounding. Um, and Jane, especially for bringing us all together and, um, you know, Temple Dance Department <laughs> is definitely wanting to learn from you. So thank you for your what for sharing. Um, let's see, is there anything else here in the? Uh, okay, so I want to thank you know everybody. Now here's the hugs and and thanks, and uh, hopefully we will see you all again. Oh, one more thing. I want to make a plug. I make a plug. We have one more, um, one more um, a panel, uh, not panel, but a colloquium in this series. Um, uh, it's um, Migrating Dance Archetypes, Circumnavigating the Gulf of Mexico with Anita Gonzalez in, on March 8th. So please tune in for that. And um, yes, uh, thank you, audience, for being with us. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> right on, Marianne. Woohoo! Thank you, you so it. much, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Have everybody. a good day. Bye, everyone. It was amazing. Thank you. <laughs>